Hello, my name is Aaron Whitehead and I am a Compliance Coordinator at Strategies to End Homelessness. Welcome to this training on Financial and Administrative Policies and Procedures. This recording is made available to our community in order to make our training efforts more accessible. We hope this is a helpful way for you to access this content on your own time. Our hope in offering this training is to do the following. To better understand the importance of strong policies and procedures, to review federal, state, and local requirements, to gather tools to strengthen and support your organization. Please note that this training is not exhaustive. There are a vast number of federal requirements governing policies and procedures. We have chosen to focus on those most relevant to the awards administered by strategies and those that are the most likely to present difficulties in planning and implementation. While I would love to take the time to discuss every aspect of grant eligibility in detail, I had to pick a few main topics so that this presentation didn't take all day. Here is a summary of what we'll be covering today. Number one, we will briefly overview the structure of policies and procedures and the different levels of requirements. Number two, we will go in depth on some of the key policies and procedures, discussing the specific regulations behind them and examining some of the difficulties in their construction. And number three, we will look at the why behind this approach and what else an organization needs to supplement the policies and procedures discussed in section two. We begin with an overview of policies and procedures. Good policies and procedures should function as the, as the skeleton of an organization. They provide structure, balance, and strength to support the organization's mission. An organization does not, of course, function on policies and procedures alone. It requires the everyday input and improvisation skills of a number of staff working together toward organizational goals. Something else to remember is that policies and procedures can provide guidance for new employees, as well as document what the organization is already doing in order to provide a foundation of institutional knowledge so that the burden doesn't rely upon the memory of a few individuals. In addition to these practical reasons, many policies and procedures are mandated or required. There are many different authorities that might mandate that an agency have certain policies and procedures in place. Number one, legal requirements are those enshrined in law passed by federal, state, or local legislators. Fair housing policy, for example, derives from federal regulation. Although in our case, the city of Cincinnati also has fair housing protections that go beyond those enshrined in federal law, as we will discuss later. Number two, regulatory requirements are those put into place by federal agencies, such as HUD, that are binding upon recipients and subrecipients of federal funds, but are not the project of legislation. One example of this is that HUD recently waived certain requirements for ESG, COC, and HOPWA grants that were regulatory in nature due to the COVID-19 crisis. HUD does not have the authority to waive any legal requirements. Only the appropriate legislative authority can do so. Grant-specific requirements are, as the name indicates, requirements that only apply narrowly to certain grants or funding streams. For example, different federal grants have different record retention requirements, a fact that an agency with multiple funding streams should be aware of. Cincinnati is unique in that it has several required policies and procedures that are specific to the community. The COC board has the authority to require agencies to maintain and adhere to certain policies and procedures as part of their participation in the continuum of care. Lastly, some requirements are specific only to the funder. These requirements are typically set forth in grant agreements. The city of Cincinnati, for example, sets forth in its ESG agreement with strategies that certain forms of insurance are required to be carried by recipients and subrecipients. Strategies passes these requirements along to its re subrecipients in its own subawards. Also, I should state that this training will be reviewing only those policies and procedures that pertain to the financial aspect of your organization or the overall administration of your organization. Policies that refer to the administration and delivery of services for individual clients, uh, say a rental determination policy for rapid rehousing or a participant termination policy, 
are not a part of this training. Having discussed some very broad principles, we will proceed now to look at certain specific policies and procedures. We will discuss some of the detailed requirements for each area, as well as some common issues or errors that Strategies has observed in the community. I have endeavored to list relevant regulatory citations where possible at the bottom of the page. Financial policies and procedures is truly a catch-all term. What exactly goes into your own organization's financial policies and procedures is largely up to your discretion, so long as you are operating in compliance. I've seen some agencies include precise instructions, such as the exact steps necessary to enter an expense into accounting software. Other agencies tend to deal more in generalities. What you choose largely depends on what is a good fit for your organization. However, certain items are required to be included in financial policies and procedures. A chart of accounts is required to show that the agency has the ability to track within its accounting system expenditures, not just by grant, but by budget line or similar cost center designation. It is also required that an agency set forth what internal controls they have in place to provide for the security of federal funds or other assets. Most agencies have a policy or chart setting forth the segregation of duties, such as cash handling, to ensure that no one individual in the company has too much influence on all aspects of a financial transaction. Federal regulations require that you have a system in place to determine eligible costs. The exact nature of how to determine cost eligibility is set forth in 2 CFR 200. I've noted the more relevant sections below. The extent of this policy is largely up to your agency, although I don't know that I've ever seen a policy that was too thorough. Discussing eligibility and allocation in one's policies and procedures is an important safeguard to ensure that these principles of eligibility are part of your organization's DNA. Also, any travel costs charged to the federal grant must be made consistently with your agency's own policies and procedures. For example, if your agency states that employees will be paid on a per diem basis for overnight travel, but one employee is reimbursed via receipts, then your agency is acted in conflict with your own policies and procedures, and the cost is ineligible. As a side note, many agencies include their travel policy in their employee handbook rather than their financial policies and procedures, and this is fine. Feel free to add any other policies and procedures to this list that help your agency function more effectively and consistently with requirements. Some examples of policies that are not required but can prove very useful are an audit policy determining the process for securing a single audit, including the process for going through procurement for audit costs, an insurance policy that sets out which policies the agency will secure and how the procurement process will be handled, an allocation policy setting forth how certain costs are allocated and how often the method for allocation will be updated or revisited. Any one of these policies may prove to be a good fit for your organization. There is a lot that goes into a procurement policy, and in fact, there are many very long trainings discussing the procurement policy alone. While we don't have enough time here to fully engage every aspect of a successful procurement policy, here are certain federal requirements that must be in any procurement policy. Number one, there are certain tiers of procurement, the small purchase threshold, the simplified acquisition threshold, that are set forward in 2 CFR 200. While your agency can set stricter requirements than what is set forth in 2 CFR 200, such as lowering thresholds, you cannot make them less restrictive. If your agency is using the precise thresholds as set forth in 2 CFR 200 with no changes, this should be made clear. Remember also that these spending thresholds should be a good fit for your agency. Smaller agencies would be better served with lower thresholds, and that they should reflect the relative importance or gravity of the cost in question. Number two, federal regulations forbid entering into businesses that are suspended or debarred from doing business with the federal government. If you're not sure whether an entity might be suspended or debarred, you can look them up in SAM.gov. That's SAM.gov. Strategies requires all subrecipients to sign a debarment certificate stating that they are not currently suspended or debarred from doing business with the federal government per the regulations. Number three, 2 CFR 200.321 requires that agencies must take all necessary affirmative steps 
to assure that minority businesses, women's business enterprises, and labor surplus area firms are used when possible. You will need to show some way in which you are meeting this requirement, and so it is recommended that these be written into your policies and procedures. There is a City of Cincinnati website with a list of businesses that could be helpful for this purpose. Number four, one regulation that is not required to be written down but must be adhered to is that your organization not make unnecessary or duplicative purchases. One would hope that this would be common sense, but a best practice is to enter this into your policies so that it is absolutely clear. And lastly, your procurement policy can be further supplemented simply by documenting the way your organization is or should be operating. Is there a prescribed process for requesting a rental payment? Does your organization maintain a vendor list? And if so, how and how often is it updated? Remember that while these policies are HUD requirements, they are also opportunities to document processes for new hires and also to maintain institutional knowledge. This tool is the Procurement Claw, which I have included here as a helpful illustration of the many different methods of making purchases with federal funds. You'll notice that each manner of purchase is listed with short detail about some general statements of procurement. You can see one through five there, the different methods of making purchases. And I have listed at the bottom the thresholds as set forth in the regulations in 2 CFR 200. Record retention is another policy that is required by federal regulations. I said at the beginning that requirements often come with multiple layers, and that is the case with record retention. 2 CFR 200 establishes a requirement for all federal awards that records must be kept at least three years after the end of the grant term. However, some individual grants have their own individual requirements that exceed the federal minimum. The HOPWA grant requires that documentation be maintained for at least four years after the end of the grant term, whereas both the COC and ESG grants require five years. While you could, theoretically, maintain a different record retention policy for different grants, I imagine that would be a colossal headache and that it would be easier to come up with one policy that meets the strictest requirement. Our community currently is in the process of implementing HUD's HMIS data standards that will govern all agencies contributing data to our local system. While these standards have not yet been finalized, I thought it best to go ahead and inform you about these additional record retention requirements. These require that records of HMIS data must be maintained for seven years. Also, there is an additional requirement that at the end of this seven-year period, all records, including HMIS data, be either destroyed or effectively de-identified. Record retention is a perfect example of these layered requirements, which can be a challenge when trying to adopt one policy that satisfies the many different layers. Few policies are as vitally important as a confidentiality policy. Everyone attending this training deals, probably quite often, with personally identifiable information, PII, that would be considered sensitive and is protected. It is vital that everyone in your organization know what standards they are being held to in regards to this sensitive information. Certain requirements apply to all federal awards. 2 CFR 200.303E states that agencies must take reasonable measures to safeguard protected PII. While most everyone understands that this applies to client information, it must be noted that it also applies to all protected PII. This would include also employee payroll records, personal information maintained on donors, any payment receipts or requests with credit cards numbers listed, etc. Make sure your confidentiality policy is broad enough to cover your entire organization and not just your participants. As with record retention, certain grants have more specific confidentiality requirements. One perfect example is the HOPWA grant. HOPWA, that's Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, regulations and federal guidance go into much more detail about confidentiality due to the nature of the program, since all participants are dealing with a specific medical history that is sensitive and protected. 2 CFR 200.112 specifically requires conflict of interest policies for federal awards. It also requires that the agency report any potential conflict of interest either to HUD 
or the pass-through entity, which in this case would be strategies, whichever your grant agreement is with. Exactly what qualifies as a conflict of interest is different for different regulations. There are certain specific requirements and prohibitions listed in regards to the procurement process, but for the most part, use your best judgment or feel free to consult relevant legal or regulatory authorities. One example of this is that members of the COC board all sign conflict of interest statements, as there can be a conflict of interest between their work on the COC board and the agency that employs them. We at Strategies sign conflict of interest forms where our organization defines a conflict of interest clearly, and we either declare what conflicts we have or sign that we have none. One thing we see often from local agencies is that their conflict of interest policy is not all-encompassing. Many policies state that they only apply to employees. The policy should, in fact, apply to employees, board members, volunteers, and any other agents acting on your behalf. The regulations concerning the drug-free workplace policy are, in a way, much easier because there is a list of things set forth in 2 CFR 182.205 called What Must I Include in My Drug-Free Workplace Statement? I would encourage you to review the relevant regulations yourself, but to review it quickly. One, you must inform employees that certain activities, such as those listed here on the slide, are prohibited in the workplace. Two, you must specify what action will be taken for those that violate the policy. Three, you must inform employees that abiding by the policy is a condition of employment. Four, and here's the part most people forget, you must inform employees that they must notify you in writing if they are convicted for a violation of a criminal drug statute occurring in the workplace and must do so no more than five calendar days after the conviction. Except for the latter point, most of these things are common sense and probably already in your drug-free workplace statement. However, be sure to review, review the regulations anyway. After we at Strategies have completed a monitoring visit, we will fill out a set of tools published by HUD to record the results of our visit. One of the questions on HUD's tools asks if there is an organization chart that establishes clear lines of responsibilities for all HUD awards. Org charts can be complex, and I've seen more than one that is unreadable on an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, but it must be possible to trace the lines of responsibility from top to bottom of those employees working on the HUD award. Job descriptions, of course, should be an accurate reflection of what the people on the org chart are doing. It's impossible for HUD to follow around all employees and watch what they're doing, but it should be in line with what is set forward in their job description and should be for eligible activities per regulations. It should also match the activities they are recording on their timesheets. Protection from housing discrimination is of vital importance. There are certain groups of people that are protected from discrimination by law, and this must be reflected in your fair housing policy. You should have a fair housing policy or similar policy that provides specifically for non-discrimination in housing. Many organizations have non-discrimination policies, but these are often specific to employment discrimination rather than housing discrimination. I have included here a list of those classes of people protected from housing discrimination by federal law. However, I must note that the City of Cincinnati, in addition to providing anti-discrimination protection for these groups, also offers anti-housing discrimination protection for other classes of people, namely sexual orientation, transgender status, and Appalachian regional origin. Anyone providing or facilitating housing in the city of Cincinnati should have these protections codified in their fair housing policy. Insurance requirements. There are no requirements for insurance set forward in the federal regulations. However, for every grant that passes through strategies, there comes an actual grant agreement, a legally binding document. If you read the fine print, you will find that the funder, either federal, state, city, or private, often has requirements that recipients and subrecipients must carry certain types and amounts of insurance. Strategies has taken account of all of these requirements and passes them through in almost all of the agreements and subawards it signs with you. I have listed here the insurance policies required of subrecipients by strategies for almost all subawards. This is a general listing. Refer to the text of your subaward for specific requirements, including types of coverage and actual dollar figures.
2 CFR 200.300 states that the non-federal entity, that's you, is responsible for complying with all requirements of the federal award. See also statutory requirements for whistleblower protections. And then it mentions certain specific federal laws. Therefore, protection for whistleblowers is something enshrined in U.S. law. Five U.S. statutes are listed in the regulations in 2 CFR 200, but I'll quote briefly from 41 U.S.C. 4712. An employee of a contractor, subcontractor, grantee, or subgrantee, or personal services contractor may not be discharged, demoted, or otherwise discriminated against as a reprisal for disclosing to a person or body described in paragraph 2 information that the employee reasonably believes is evidence of gross mismanagement of a federal contractor grant, a gross waste of federal funds, an abuse of authority relating to a federal contract or grant, a substantial and specific danger to public health or safety, or a violation of law, rule, or regulation related to a federal contract, including the competition for or negotiation of a contract or grant. These policies can be a part of other employee policies, such as an ethics policy or a set of employee conduct policies, but they should be set forth somewhere so that these statutory protections are established. The policy and procedure requirements that I have discussed should be considered the bare minimum. We encourage you to seek more ways to document your agency's processes and to clearly set forth what requirements people at your agency should meet, what processes they should follow, and what protections they have. It would be impossible for us to make this, these decisions for everyone, simply because every program is different. Each project has its own particular problem areas. For example, an emergency shelter or a site-based project will have a set of policies associated with residents on site that a tenant-based rental assistant project would not. A domestic violence project has an entirely different set of privacy and confidentiality issues to consider. It's important to keep in mind that a good set of policies and procedures aren't just there to meet requirements, but to establish best practices. I've gone over a lot of specific information here, all of which is very important. There is no way I could go over all of the specifics I would like. That would literally take all day. But in closing, there are three general thoughts I hope you will take away from this. Number one, review the regulations and keep reviewing them. Have multiple people on your team review them and consult them when you have questions. Number two, set clear policies. And of course, what good are clear policies unless they are followed? A lovely and well-written policy that covers the regulations is no good if it gets stuck in a drawer and gathers dust. Abiding by your own policies and procedures is a regulatory requirement. Lastly, feel free to reach out to us with questions. We would always rather discuss something in detail before a monitoring visit than have to issue a concern when we perform our annual review. This is the best way to ensure that we are communicating on the same wavelength in regards to what the regulations are. I have listed the relevant contact information here for those of us in the Compliance Department at Strategies and Homelessness. Feel free to contact your designated contact person or myself if you have any questions. And please feel free to reach out to me at awhitehead at nhomelessness.org if you have any other questions at all. Thank you for listening and taking part in this presentation. As I said, feel free to reach out to me with any questions you may have. Thank you.